So um, yeah, I want to talk to you about Defab House. So Defab House um, was a, a collaborative innovation project that was run by the uh, National Center of Competence and Research Digital Fabrication here at ETH, together with ETH and, and EMPA. And so the special thing about it is that it was actually um, not just a sort of a lab demonstration of um, research, but it was a project where um, new research in digital fabrication was directly transferred into a construction project. And the only way that that works is by um, basically pooling resources um, by all the research institutions that were involved here and then uh, a number of companies that would help us actually um, realize um, that vision. And so here you can see um, there were about 40 industry partners that helped and there were three research institutions mainly involved, which is basically um, the NCCR Digital Fabrication, ETH, and then EMPA, which is also a research institute that is um, part of the ETH domain. Um, the NCCR Digital Fabrication um, is basically doing research uh, in all kinds of digital fabrication processes, but um, there are two grand challenges that uh, we've um, set for ourselves, and that is to um, advance digital in situ fabrication, so to try to bring digital fabrication out to the construction sites, and then to advance uh, bespoke or customized digital prefabrication, meaning that, you know, basically doing prefabrication, but without the um, classical limitations that you uh, more or less associate with prefabrication. So get away from the uh, repetitive um, um, kind of mass produced kind of prefabrication into a more um, individualized model. Um, Nest is where the DFAB house is located. It's, uh, it's kind of a research um, building, they call it a backbone. So on the right side, you see kind of a diagram. It's, a, it's like a sort of an empty shelf of a building that um, is located in Dubendorf, near Zurich at the EMPA campus. And the idea is that EMPA um, provides this as a sub, like sort of a substructure and a, a superstructure for research teams and groups from industry and research to build on. And um, you can build sort of modules that then are being placed um, or directly built on those platforms. The idea of Nest is to um, kind of bridge the divide between um, academic research and then industry, classical industry uh, activities such as product development and production by uh, providing a space where applied research could take place. Meaning that basically we need a place where um, we can work together with industry and with um, academia on real projects to facilitate um, the kind of exchange it's lacking. And you can see Nest, for those of you who don't know it, it's like basically on the left, you can see it before Diva House was built. It's uh, sort of those empty floor slabs. On the left, you can see the original state of it. It's really empty, lots of room to build. And on the right side of the same image, you can see some of the modules that were already built in there. And then on the right side, we see the same thing with a default house on top. So you get the idea, it's kind of um, room to build. And obviously next to default house, there's lots of space for uh, future projects as well. The idea was that we said, well, if we wanted to um, demonstrate digital construction or digital fabrication in, in construction architecture, we needed to actually have a fully functional building. And um, in this case, the client said, okay, we would like you to do make this uh, residential building. And um, we chose to then do a three-story building, which um, is basically the average, or like sort of the, the average um, residential building in Switzerland, which is on average a three-story building. So we thought that was kind of representative. And um, so here, this is kind of the basic idea. It's a, a structure for four inhabitants. And the actually people live in it now that has sort of an open ground floor for people to share and then some private rooms at the top. Um, so the idea 
generally was to say, okay, we need to do a fully functional building. We need to do something that's permitted. Um, that means if we actually able to um, construct it, it should be buildable um, yeah, or like, you know, that's the, the technology should be deployable to a regular construction project. And um, so it's real requirements and constraints. We didn't actually get any um, exceptions from the building codes. And the idea then was to say, okay, as much as possible within this project at this time, we wanted to close the digital chain from design to uh, through planning to, to construction. And that means to not just um, digitally plan and design the building, but also to digitally um, produce um, the building as far as we could with the technologies that we had at the time. Um, and those technologies were actually six digital construction technologies that we selected from the research of the NCCR. And all of um, those were actually used for the first time in the reconstruction project. Um, the goal was to say, if we go from the lab to full construction, full building scale, um, that will enable us to prove feasibility to say, okay, this can really be built at this time. It's not just some sort of concept or it's not the future. It's actually what we can do today. And why we do that to um, increase the technology readiness level, as this is also um, sort of a big prototype or demonstrator that will allow to use some resources to advance the technology as we build, as we design and build it. Um, it also had the goal of building interdisciplinary teams in research and industry or between research and industry really as well with the idea that those teams and groups or networks um, will like or hopefully um, kind of continue to exist after the project is done. And uh, the uh, third goal was to communicate the ideas and visions um, of how we could use digital fabrication to professionals in the industry, but also to the general public. And you can see about 40 uh, people those are the R&D um, team, like all the ETH basically uh, members that were involved in this project. Um, if you count all the people, uh, including also the uh, industry, then you would end up at actually like not just 40, but uh, more than 100 people who, who were uh, involved here. And that's the idea to kind of create a larger network for the exchange of ideas um, that um, is basically um tightened or put together um by um or like um by by having a a common goal which is uh, this project the disciplines involved in research actually architects we had roboticists um, we had computer scientists material scientists sexual engineers and mechanical engineers but also experts for sustainable construction and we had try to bring in some of the content of construction management. <coughs> Excuse me. So the idea, um, and I think from your projects or your preliminary ideas in, in the IC classes, um, you might actually have thought about having some of these disciplines also included in your projects. I'm gonna, excuse, I, I, I'm gonna just show this video um, to kind of make um, clear what the, what give the general touch and feel of the project. And after that, I want to get in a little bit into detail about the uh, uh, different innovation objects um, that are, that this project contains. Okay, can you guys hear the sound as well? No, it's okay. And we have subtitles, so it's okay. So you can basically just see uh, a few of the um, activities that took place. The on-site robotics, for instance, here with the uh, mesh mold wall. I'm going to try and talk. I can hear the video, which is kind of a problem. OK, I turn it off. So, um, here, for instance, the uh, use of 3D printing, 
at the full scale, which is a technology transfer. This is myself talking about the project. <coughs> and you can see that there's um, a mix of a, a lot of different technologies and, and materials. Um, and also not just automation, but also um, um, a combination of um, kind of the sort of things that you know from construction um, combined with new workflows and technologies. The same is true for materials. Um, it's not like everything in this project is new. There's many known materials. It's just that the focus was on trying to um, find new ways of um, actually using those materials. <clears throat> You can see the bespoke timber pre prefabrication. And it's also, again, um, a project that was um, actually tested some automated processes, but it wasn't focused on full process automation. Um, for one, the one reason for that is that it's a research project, which doesn't the same um, resources as, as an industrial application would, but also because the focus was on trying to understand the strength of the automated systems versus the strength um, of the uh, human worker to figure out what really makes sense to automate. Um, is it really necessary to kind of think about automating the entire process or is it um, strategically like more interesting to actually focus on certain parts of the process to be automated? For instance, with the goal of opening up new possibilities in terms of architecture technology. Um, okay, yeah. So generally the, um, one second. Yeah. So generally the um, idea is that um, in order to build digitally, there needs to be some sort of um, transfer of rules and constraints or information from upstream down to the um, <clears throat> um, upstream up to the um, design phase, but at the same time also um, some information transferred downstream, meaning like if we need to know what kind of the design system is in order to figure out what the right means of uh, fabrication uh, or production are. And this, um, this uh, kind of idea is that it's basically a closed chain or a, um, a process that includes every step from digital design and engineering through manufacturing production through assembly and the logistics right into the uh, operation phase and also the maintenance uh, phase. So it's kind of um, the beginning in this project of sort of a life cycle perspective of course, with um, the focus on the actual design through assembly processes, since here we return to improve feasibility of new processes. Um, yeah, so now I wanna um, just give you an overview of like what the different technologies were that we um, been using. And so each of these technologies is basically just in itself a case study of um, digital fabrication application. I want to start with um, <clears throat> mesh mold. So I'm kind of going from the bottom of the building through to the top, which is also kind of the way it was constructed. And it's the way that kind of the, the overall system works. So here, the goal was not to kind of find the one um, fabrication technology that would um, kind of be ideal the ideal way of um, of producing a building. It was more to kind of, the idea was to kind of spread out, um, let's say take the scope of a building and then um, use different technologies to explore what they would be best for. Um, so with MeshMall and DNC2 Fabricator, this was actually the only on-site application of digital fabrication that we had at our disposal. And um, basically, it was a mobile construction robot that was applied on site. And this is the first time this robot, which had been 
developed for many years at ETH was actually used on a reconstruction site. Um, it was combined then with a um, formwork free uh, concrete on site system, which is sort of like a no waste system, not using um, disposable formwork, uh, but still enabling freeform geometry and a kind of structurally optimized um, part. Um, so here you can see the, uh, the robot coming on site. And on the right, you can kind of see um, the principle how this worked. So the robot moves along a predefined trajectory, but it's actually able to um, reposition itself autonomously and then basically um, measure its own position in space um, in order to kind of then continue its work. And uh, the system was integrated basically from the first design steps, which you can see on the left, where there was actually um, a software developed in-house by um, the researchers um, that would give feedback to the designer in terms of what kind of geometry could be would be feasible. So here at the end, you can see some red zones, which is basically if you change the geometry to this, then you get some feedback that there's some um, areas in here that can uh, in conflict with the constraints of the fabrication tool. And then on the right, you can kind of see, so basically the whole thing is then driven from a model and that robot, um, you can run a simulation ahead of time and the robot basically executes exactly this kind of pre-programmed um, sequence. And here, so you can see what it did was uh, build up a, a mesh that is a reinforcement a mesh uh, made of steel which at the same time functions as um, the formwork in such a way that the concrete is then uh, actually filled into this kind of relatively fine mesh um, and the concrete is um, adjusted so that it actually doesn't flow out um, and that way you can uh, control the geometry of the part. On the uh, right you can see what happened basically there's also a feedback system so as we know that there are construction tolerances whether or not you uh, fabricate robot robotically um, we um, basically uh, had a feedback system that would um, transfer the as-built information, basically the robot measuring its, its own um, product uh, dimensionally back into uh, the digital model of the part. So at the end that when, um, you're, when you're done building it, you have an as-built model that actually takes into account the production errors or tolerances. Here you can see some happy researchers that um, basically um, on their finished um, um, formwork slash um, reinforcement part. And this was then combined with actually a very manual process of filling the geometry, but it wasn't actually a problem um, to do this manually. It was actually very important. Um, more important that the, um, um, the system like the, the, re, the reinforcement actually ma was made robotically because that's where you controlled all the dimensions of the part. And at the end to, in order to um, fill it and actually do the surface, all that was needed was um, um, a very simple tool that would make sure that you are it was equidistant when you uh, do the surface from the reinforcement. So that way um, the digital, like very tightly controlled geometry was then rendered exactly on the surface of the part. And this is kind of um, the result that, that we got from, from this. Um, give me just one second, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, so and then the rest of the building was really all prefabricated, but with very different technologies. So here you can see a smart slab, which is basically the element that um, was built on top of uh, this mesh mob wall. Um, it was um, also a concrete element um, using 3D printing um, technology for the formwork. And so as we were not able to actually print a part like this um, directly um, because of the material properties of the 3D print, um, the decision was made to actually try to print the formwork and then transfer the actual uh, benefits of uh, using 3D printing to a precast element, mainly by they, um, having more control over the geometry, 
and being able to optimize material use through this. And then also to uh, have just like generally um, more complex geometry uh, at so it's sort of uh, the same um, cost that you would um, have to uh, build a simpler element with the same technology. Um, here you can see kind of um, the motivation. Um, basically, the mesh mold wall was built with a robot. It shows the freeform potential. And it's also basically a part that um, was actually structurally op optimized. Um, this S shape is actually what makes the building laterally stiff. This wall actually carries the load from the entire building. But in order to actually use this kind of a structure, we had to design a, um, a slab that was um, adjusted to have an interface with this very complex shape below. And that, of course, had a profound effect on the structural system of the slab itself. Um, and here you can see how, how that worked out. And with conventional means, there, there'd be no point uh, building a slab like this. It'd be uh, very expensive and inefficient. And at the same time, um, basically, you would also question why you would um, the um, why um, why would you would you would call into question um, the use of the mesh mode wall uh, itself as well, because if you can't plan across interfaces and you can't actually integrate it successfully in the overall system, then whichever benefits the mesh mode uh, wall may, might have. Uh, may not be benefits for the overall system of the building. Um, here you can see basically the uh, way this was done is that um, 3D printed formwork elements were, were, were um, printed. Those are limited to the size of the printer. Um, here, um, in this case, it was the, uh, about a couple of meters long. And those were then combined into larger um, panels, which are still transportable size and then cast with concrete. And then there was a second part of a formwork that would make sure that we um, could actually have a structural rib system that connected with this very thin shell geometry. You can see the, the sand printing process, which is actually something that's already on the market, uh, but it had uh, just previously never been used on the scale of construction. In the middle, you see how the sand is then removed from the parts when they're, when they're done. And some of the, um, produce parts uh, on the right. And here the process, actually like very um, manual process again of concreting those elements. So again, we have a combination of some digitally produced elements with a manual task, but the overall result is something that you couldn't achieve without the uh, digital fabrication technology. Um, and then here, um, the lifting in of, of one of those um, elements. And you can see the shell geometry is very, very slender. So um, this is expressing the idea that you know, using this kind of tightly controlled geometry that you can achieve with digital fabrication, um, you could try and really optimize those parts in order to um, try to reduce um, the weight and material volume of those parts. You can also see there's some kind of pre to find openings for the installations in the slab, which um, also were pre-coordinated with the system. And again, this is also something that you couldn't very easily uh, produce otherwise. Then we have another uh, concrete technology, some dynamic casting, which is basically a slip forming process. And this is kind of the most automated uh, technology used in the DFAB house. Um, it's a reusable flexible formwork. We see that in a second. So it can be actually like reused indefinitely. And it's much smaller actually than the part that you're producing. And this again allows um, this kind of customized prefabrication because since the uh, formwork is flexible, actually every time you use it, you can dimensionally um, change the exact geometry of the part that you're making. So here on the left, you can kind of see an animation that shows um, very in a simple way how this works. So the, the form works only like a half, 50 centimeters uh, tall, it's sort of a mini robot. So it's actuated two sides of uh, no, one side of it um, was actuated in order to um, control the geometry. And then um, it could slip those columns, which are actually considerably larger than this small form itself. itself. 
And here you can see uh, the result of that. Um, again, of course, these are facade mullions and, and this is just like one specific application, but what it expresses again is that you can actually structurally optimize parts of a building. So if you apply this on a whole different scale, you could probably like reach an economy of scale which would um, have an impact. And like here where it's more like just a demonstration to get the idea across. Since here you can actually save a lot of material um, when you only make like 15 columns. But again, it's about the idea of optimization and the technical feasibility. And the idea that you can actually fully automate a process from the batch of mixed concrete to the finished part um, that doesn't um, require any intervention um, whatsoever. So this is something that theoretically could also be run overnight in a factory uh, with maybe just somebody remotely supervising. Um, then we have a robotic um, assembly uh, part, which is basically, this is um, the closest to sort of like um, um, the uh, modular construction as we know it, um, except that here we have robotic technology meeting sort of the, the modular timber um, production process. Again, this leads to more customization um, because those modules are actually not made of uh, flat parts that are then subsequently uh, assembled, but those uh, modules are actually built in three dimensions, like in space by two robots. Um, and this is the, um, the idea of collaborative robotics, where basically uh, robots can support each other doing certain tasks. Um, and this allows sort of a more parametric um, approach to um, making individual modules, but it also requires a really predefined fabrication aware design. So here you can see how this uh, looked, what this looked like in the uh, robotic, robotic fabrication lab at, at ETH. Um, again, not full automation. You have these two robots. One of them basically um, places a piece and the next robot um, puts the next piece in place. Um, while the first robot is still acting as a support. And then when that is in place, then both robots can go basically into the next round once the system stabilizes, stabilizes itself. What you can also see in the picture, we have somebody uh, drilling uh, or like basically putting screws in. So again, this is the idea that not the full system needs to be automated to, be, to make sense. So in this case, for instance, and there was a process from the raw material or like standard timber beam as you can um, as, you, as it gets delivered from the from the sawmill more or less, um, where the robot grabs it, puts it on the saw, where it is cut to the uh, um, right angle and um, length according to the uh, digital model, and then it's also pre-drilled in terms of like making screw channels to make sure the screws are placed very precisely. And then it's um, in the same kind of step, it's also directly placed in the structure. In that way, you can um, control the tolerances, you can uh, automate like all those steps, but at the same time, um, you can still have some manual tasks, which then are not lacking sort of the precision that the human worker will by themselves not um, be able to deliver because the part is already made in a way that guides that guides this process. So here you can see the steps, some of the steps, the sawing, which is uh, in, in, in the production line, then the drilling and milling tasks, and at the end, the placement. Um, here's some of the modules as they were then uh, finished in at ETH, and those were then transported and installed on site uh, in one day. So basically you have classic modular structure which um, with the difference that the modules are all different sizes different orientations and they really like structurally only combine into a functioning structure um, as you connect them as you connect them on site and that has to do let me just go back that has to do with the optimization idea so you could algorithmically uh, actually optimize those um, those space frame structures in a way that would equalize the loads throughout the system so that at the end you can minimize um, the, the cross-section of each of the elements used. And the idea is the same as before, um, to just minimize the material use 
and sort of have a, um, in this case, a demonstration of this potential in the building. And then this, of course, um, will bring us kind of to um, the same problem we saw before with the uh, mesh mode wall and, and the slab, which is, you know, if you have like certain non-standard geometries, then it's always difficult to, um, or the, the kind of a non-standard aspect of it um, is, um, has to be considered across interfaces to other parts of the building. So in this case, you couldn't put a standard facade or a glass facade on this kind of geometry because it's just not possible. And so in this case, um, we needed to also develop a facade system which would um, be able to then um, sort of form an overall um, system that is structural, an integrated structural and envelope system um, in, together with this timber structure. So there was a membrane structure um, together with um, translucent aerogel. And this is again, kind of an example where, you know, this technology or this, this kind of uh, material that we, we were using for the thermal insulation is actually um, a lot more expensive than conventional. Um, let's say rock wool insulation or mineral wool insulation that you typically use in a timber building. At the same time, it has also some properties that are different and beneficial. So in this case, light, natural light can come through, uh, through the wall. And, but this again, of course, wouldn't make a business case for this kind of system. However, um, what this also does is basically you can do a whole residential building and you can you know, as you get the natural light into the building through the wall, you can minimize um, the window um, surface, for instance. So we um, balance it in our budget uh, this way, where basically we had a premium of, on the material cost, but at the same time, um, we also had a lot of savings with some other elements that typically um, would have been, um, have, would have had, or would, would have basically used more resources. So it's a sort of like a balancing act, but what it shows is that if you want to kind of use an innovation in your in your strategy, then it's sort of like you know you need to kind of figure out where the offsets are or where the synergies are um, with the other elements of the building. And this was a very, like very performance based design. Basically, it was really designed to um, function with the building and to have the uh, meet the thermal insulation properties that were required and at the same time deliver kind of the interior lighting and natural lighting that we needed. And here you can kind of see how like all of these things combine then into, into, this, uh, into this one building um, um, day and night and how also on the inside of course uh, this building was used to now kind of demonstrate some of the potential that digital fabrication has to also impact um, the architecture, meaning you could build things that are just beyond what you um, typically um, used to seeing in a building. Yeah, kind of from, from the upstairs. Um, so the idea being that, you know, at the end, um, these processes have certain properties and they, they offer certain potential and that the building would um, be here as a demonstrator to also express this kind of potential in its built form not only in the process of being built. So what, what have we learned from this? <laughs> um, we have learned that basically demonstrating, I mean, the, the primary goal of this was, um, you know, not going as far as let's say the proposals you would have to make um, or like a business case for, for these kind of technologies. Um, the primary goal here was to really just show that it can be done and provide a building or platform where these ideas could be then discussed and, and developed further. And, and what we did learn was that in order to achieve these things, we really need to work on our collaborative processes and figure out, you know, we can't, you can't build a digitally designed and fabricated building just thinking uh, along the, the regular kind of disciplinary boundaries and the, the regular kind of um, craft standards like you need to actually really you uh, these processes often um, blur the boundaries between uh, different like um different the scope of different parties uh, that are involved in, in building 
Um, also, what it does is um, it allows us to kind of have an intense process of exchange between uh, very different parties that might not typically in a construction project be um, in such in such an exchange. So basically, um, that um, the fact that executing contractors are also research and de development partners, and um, that researchers and planning professionals and engineers actually um, are often um, in the same room at the same table developing those systems together. And this seemed to be a really great way to uh, move some of those ideas along. And um, this is also what typically probably happens more and uh, more verti vertic like vertically integrated companies, for instance, where you're really kind of um, looking at the entire um, supply chain or the entire um, production um, process kind of in a more holistic way. So that was another lesson we learned. So you really, really have to do that in order to get ahead. Um, sustainability was something that we'd really thought about a lot and I'm mentioning it here because I think it's getting rightfully so um, a lot more attention. And I think sustainability is becoming, um, the, the demand for it is going to, um, of course, increase and that will also impact future business models where basically um, I think it can become a source of competitive advantage to perform better th than um, competing systems. So we, we try to kind of have those general ideas in there and we see a lot of um, interest in especially the materials, savings, optimization part of things, even though when we um, calculate some of these things, uh, like get, actually when we get to the hard numbers with DFAB House, it's not like we really score um, super high on all counts because it was simply not uh, sort of the focus um, and there were see, simply wasn't the time and the resources to optimize those systems further. But I guess the potential um, is something that, that we were able to show. And then, you know, at the end, if you think about digital um, business models, but also digital, um, technologies and the way they can be employed. employed. Um, it really gets into the territory of like, well, how do we actually want to work in the future? And what does the workplace look like? And often uh, what we overlook is that we don't only design a process or design uh, a project, we also um, implicitly at least redesign the workplace of the future as well. So here we can see one of the uh, carpenters who was on the project. So this is actually a carpenter who usually works in conventional projects, who is here um, in a whole new role uh, controlling a robot. Um, and then this kind of brings me to the end already. I stole this uh, slide from Daniel, uh, more or less. But you know, I think what, what all this uh, leaves us with is, um, what we really still have to think about is what are the digital business models that will um, help digital fabrication break through in the AEC sector. So we have digital fabrication and robotics on, on one side where we now have increasing technological uh, capacities and, and, and capabilities. And we have that, we have companies of course already that have this prefab industrialized mindset um, and, and mainly sort of from the efficiency kind of standpoint. But if you combine those two potentials together, um, what might we end, what, what, what might we end up with? I think that's a really interesting question. And this is also the reason why um, I was happy to kind of show this project uh, in the industrialized construction class. Um, so that kind of brings me to the end and yeah. I'd be happy to answer some questions or, you know, discuss some ideas um, around this with you guys. Thank you very much, Conrad. And we have time for five minutes uh, for questions. So as always, please put them in the chat. <clears throat> or if you'd like, you can raise your hand and, uh, or unmute yourself and feel free to ask the question out loud. I think we're gonna stop sharing because then I can see you guys better.
I think we have one in the chat here. I'll just repeat it so everyone can see. Um, it's from uh, Yibin who asks, uh, would you describe this project as a product of a production platform or as a one-off building that utilizes certain industrialized methods? Well, I think it certainly is like the latter. Um, if even, let's say, I mean, I think that even the second definition is maybe a step above what this was, because um, I think it's not yet quite employing industrialized methods. It's actually demonstrating technologies that might have the potential of turning into industrialized methods. And um, I think to the, the experience that, that I've made, and I think many people on the project have made, is that um, the kind of ideas, like the way that these technologies are used in DFAB House, um, we're not, they're not exactly what uh, maybe makes sense for a typical, um, like sort of like, let's say a market um, project that would, would actually have to take into account um, not just the technology and sort of a slightly artificial, maybe higher budget than typical, but also basically would have to uh, um, address a market um, demand. And, and what we see now is like talking to the partners, but also other companies who come and, and look at this, is that um, they pick up those ideas, they're really interested in understanding how it works, and then they often um, sort of pick out a certain aspect and say, okay, this, like let's say the material control you've used in, um, in the smart dynamic casting uh, process or this automated slip casting, that could be something uh, in our context that could help us develop a process, you know, let's say that that could save us money or increase our quality or something like this. So um, basically, um, there's so much in those technologies, like so many different factors um, that um, have potential. But at the same time, this project wasn't actually it didn't have the attention, intention yet to actually like weight those potentials against uh, each other um, and figure out what, what would be actually the, the most um, sort of what, what would address sort of the market in, in, in a certain way. And I think this is now the next step um, that, and that's the discussion we can have now um, because the te technologies are sort of uh, demonstrated and proven from a technical kind of standpoint. 